Hey everyone, this is part two of two of a speedrunner's guide to end fights, specifically for Minecraft Java version 1.16 solo runs. In part one, we covered end fight mechanics, and now we're going to use that knowledge to understand the best end fight strategies out there currently and how to play them the most effectively. I showed this graph last time, but now we'll be going through each one of these end fight styles and talking about their advantages and disadvantages and when to use each one. I made each of these curves using a combination of simulations and lots of actual in-game end fights. Uh, it's a lot of annoying math and statistics, but if you guys would like a video covering uh, the specifics of this map, let me know in the comments and I can do that. So without further ado, let's start off with the most nostalgic strategy, the OG, the end fight strategy that started it all, the two cycle. The two cycle is the slowest of any end fight strategy today, but its one advantage is that it requires the least amount of beds, only needing two. When runners use the term cycle, it refers to the dragon flying around until it rolls a perch chance and eventually perches. The two cycle requires all 10 of the end crystals to be destroyed to prevent the dragon from healing, and as the name suggests, the runner waits for two complete perch cycles, dealing half of the dragon's health each cycle. The two cycle comes in at an unimpressive 3 minute 20 second average end fight time. And while taking out all 10 crystals results in very consistent fast perches, the fact that you need two perches means that there's still a good amount of randomness involved, so the end fight could take upwards of 4 minutes. In this table, I'm using the term high roll to signify the 90th percentile time. What that means is that a well executed end fight using this strategy will only be able to achieve this time or faster 10% of the time requiring decently good luck, while the low roll shown is the 10th percentile time, meaning only 10% of the time you would get an end fight this slow having some pretty bad luck. While the two cycle is almost never used today, as the one cycle is much faster and requires four beds which is fairly common, I highly suggest all serious speedrunners to learn this strategy and have it in their back pocket. Especially with the prevalence of tournaments nowadays, you never know when you'll be forced to enter the end with only two beds and a bow and arrow, and getting string for beds from a stronghold library can take much longer than just going straight into the end and pulling off a well-executed two-cycle. There are a few different methods for taking down crystals with a bow and arrow quickly, which we'll get into more later, but I would recommend taking out the two caged crystals first, as you don't want to get caught too far away from the center and fountain if the dragon does decide to perch. So taking out the cages first when the dragon has a low chance of perching is smart. After that, it's best to hover around the middle of the end island, but not too close to the end fountain to take out the remaining crystals. You want to put yourself in a good vantage point to have a good angle towards any crystal, but also make sure the dragon doesn't fireball the end fountain because you don't want to deal with that as the dragon perches. After destroying all 10 crystals, go to a north or south position fairly far and wait for a perch. During the first perch, I would recommend staying outside the end fountain, letting the perch happen, and then going inside. There's a fairly well-known bug I like to call the early takeoff bug, where if the dragon can't detect a player in the end at all, it will perch for 5 seconds and then unperch right away. This is pretty bad for this strategy, so we need to make sure this doesn't happen, and this bug seems to occur more often when the player is already in the end fountain during the first perch. Also, the dragon's hitbox is dangerously close to the player's head when it is perched, so avoid jumping when approaching the end fountain or being at a higher ground level when entering the perch because uh, otherwise you'll be sent flying. Uh, once inside the fountain, deal just under 50 damage to the dragon with a weapon. Uh, with a stone or an iron axe, this would be 5 full axe hits. With swords, it's a few more. And then trigger a bed directly under the dragon's head hitbox. The 45 damage from the axe plus 55 damage from the bed gets the dragon half health. Again, after this, go to a fairly far north or south position and wait for a second perch. You can uh, shoot the dragon with arrows, which will not affect its chances to perch if you need a bit more damage on it. On the second perch, you can enter the fountain early, do your axe hits, and bed the dragon for the final kill. If you're a bit short on damage, you can always finish it with arrows after it unperches. All right, well, that's enough of the two cycle. From now on, let's assume we have four or more beds entering the end. So next up, we can cover the full bow strategy. Full bow is basically the same idea as the two cycle, except now that we have four beds, we can just take out all 10 crystals and wait for a one cycle. The full bow actually comes in at a pretty respectable average of right around two minutes. 
and ends up being the most consistent strategy with the lowest amount of variance. The basic ideas are the exact same as before, ideally taking out the caged crystals early on, but this time having the option of prepping the one cycle setup. It's not required to do the one cycle setup before waiting for the perch, but doing the setup last minute can be difficult, and so most runners uh, choose to set up before taking down too many crystals. It's important to listen to your audio cues when doing full bow, because whenever the dragon fireballs you, it only has a few seconds before it has the opportunity to roll a perch afterwards. So if you miss a few arrows in a row, the dragon can randomly roll perch behind you before all the crystals are down. And this is fantastic if you notice it in time, as this gives a nice high roll end fight of about a minute 30. But if you miss the perch, you'll have to wait for a second one, which could end up as a three minute or worse end fight. Overall, I'd say the full bow end fight is medium difficulty, as there aren't too many risks, but you do need to be accurate and quick to react to the perch if needed. One last thing I'll say is that there's a particular angle that works best when taking out cage crystals. It seems weird, but about four to five blocks away works best. And yeah, there's not too much else to say about full bow strategy. It's pretty straightforward. So next up, I'd like to go over the waiting strategies. The waiting strategy is the most popular in RSG, and for good reason. It's by far the easiest end fight style, and gives the fastest high roll time. Going back to the two graphs from part one, the waiting strategy, like the name applies, means the runner isn't taking down any end crystals, but just preps the one cycle setup and waits. This means the dragon is always at a static 1 out of 13 chance to perch at every decision point, and so the question becomes, looking at the second graph, where's the best place for the runner to wait? Well, if we position ourselves very far from the end fountain, this gives the dragon a low strafe chance, and therefore higher chances to perch. But if the dragon does roll a strafe, and it's on the other side of the end island, it's going to have to fly all the way over to our side to fireball. If we instead stood one block away from the end fountain, the dragon would have a very high chance of strafing, and fireball is constantly, but when it does, it does this almost instantly. So the optimal position to wait ends up being somewhere in between. Thanks to some testing from Jojo a while back, most runners use the rule of thumb that 70 blocks away on the ground on the plus or minus Z axis or on top of a north-south pillar at around Y120 are pretty optimal positions to wait, giving a good balance of being far away for a lower strafe chance but close enough to get fireballed and reach the end fountain with a single pearl. Both of these positions lowers the strafe chance to around 15%. Looking at the curves, I've put a couple of these waiting positions on the list to compare. Waiting on the ground east-west is the slowest as you have to wait extra time for the dragon to spiral up to the east-west node over the pillar. Waiting on a north-south pillar at around Y120 is the next best, but because of the time it takes to pearl and pillar up to that height, you don't quite get the fastest time. And not to mention, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of strafe from this position when compared to the ground. So the waiting strategy that ends up being clearly the best is the north-south ground wait, which is why we see this used everywhere. You'll notice a very impressive high roll end fight time of roughly one minute, which makes sense as we're never destroying any crystals and preventing the dragon from rolling perch chances. So we already know that 1 out of 13 times we'll see an instant perch leading to a sub 1 minute end fight. But the downside of this strategy is obviously the low roll times of 4 to 5 minutes. Not destroying any crystals can result in absurdly long end fights. So in general, it's great for RSG and SSG, where you enter the end on PB pace many times, and all you need is one lucky perch. But it's the worst strategy if, say, you're in a tournament scenario where you just need to beat the game in a certain amount of time. North-South waiting is the simplest strategy of them all, but it does have its nuances. Again, prepping the one cycle can be skipped, but because we have to wait the first 25 seconds for the dragon to even roll its first perch chance anyway, there's really no harm in doing the prep first. Ideally, you'll be hovering around Z plus or minus 70, but there are some ways to play the end fight optimally. In general, you want to be as far away as possible, but if you see a strafe happening, you need to give the dragon line of sight as quickly as you can to fireball you. When the dragon is keeping its distance on the other side of the end island, that's when you want to be around Z70, so you can still have time to pearl to the center. But a good general rule of thumb is if the dragon is approaching you, then approach it as well. And after a fireball, gain as much distance away from the center as you can. And just because the end island stops doesn't necessarily mean you have to as well. Soul Speed Boots and a stack of Soul Sand is pretty common to have in these runs, so you can use this to bridge away from the center. 
It also gives you crazy good vision of the dragon and lets you cover ground back and forth very quickly. And lastly, you don't want to be excessively far from the dragon, as in theory, this could cause what's called a ghost strafe. A ghost strafe can occur if the dragon rolls a strafe chance while the player is further than 150 blocks away. The dragon basically goes into strafe mode but isn't detecting the player properly, and so it just flies around for several minutes doing nothing. Uh, it's not very well known how often this actually does happen, it's kind of hard to detect, but if you're waiting at extreme distances, this is something to be careful of. Alright, well that's all I got for the waiting strategies. Now we can move on to the most interesting, most modern idea, the half bow. There are a few different variations of the half bow that have emerged in the last few months, but the basic idea is to only destroy between 6 and 9 end crystals as quickly as possible and then wait for a perch. Now, if we go back to our graph of end crystals destroyed, it seems kind of wrong to have the ability to destroy some crystals, but not all of them. After all, having 8 crystals destroyed gives a perch chance of 20%, taking out the next one makes that 25%, and the last makes that 33. If you've already destroyed 8, why not just take out the remaining 2 and give yourself way better odds? Well, there are two main reasons for this. The first is that we have to think about the time cost in taking out the later crystals. If we only need to destroy 8 crystals, you would obviously pick the 8 easiest ones, which means we'd no longer have to deal with the cages. In the full bow strategy, traveling to the cage crystals, especially if they're far apart, can be a massive time loss. Taking out all 10 crystals while staying grounded takes roughly 45 seconds with pretty decent accuracy, whereas ignoring the cages allows for newer techniques that can destroy the 8 exposed crystals in just 15 seconds. The second reason why we'd want to leave at least one crystal remaining is a strange mechanic that I actually skipped in part 1 of this guide because it very rarely matters. The dragon's normal phase mechanics actually very slightly change when the 10th crystal is destroyed. If there are anywhere from 1 to 10 crystals in the end and the dragon decides to roll a normal phase, it will either decide on a string of 5 nodes through the center of the end or it will pick a string of 2 nodes along the outside. The two node string along the outside happens in rapid succession, and is obviously great for us as at the end of every path there's a chance to roll a perch. But when the tenth and final crystal is destroyed, the dragon's normal phase now only creates strings of two to four inner nodes and completely ignores the outer ones. With this flight pattern, the dragon is constantly changing its direction and on average rolling less perch chances. And now the dragon can actually include the east-west pillar nodes in its strings because these are inner nodes, which is really, really slow. So the half bow concept means the runner needs to destroy six to nine crystals as quickly as possible, still allowing for a decent high roll time, but also making sure it's very unlikely to low roll a terribly slow end fight. Now let's look at some of the different variations. The first is the grounded half bow. This is similar to what we've seen before, as the runner does their best to take out the lowest crystals and any cages that may be on their path already, but leaving the higher out of reach crystals. It's the safest variation, but most difficult to hit the bow shots, so it ends up coming in at a respectable 2 minute 11 average, but not that impressive of a high roll time. Next up is my absolute personal favorite, the Automat variation. Now, I'm sure lots of different runners have decided on, you know, the best, most optimal positions to shoot a bow and arrow from, but Automat developed this idea specifically and really popularized it within the last few months, so I think it's a fitting name. For this half bow idea, you build off of your one cycle setup by a few blocks to give yourself a nice vantage point. Take down the shorter crystals first, allow the dragon's breath to land, block up by one, and then take down the higher up crystals. It's actually surprisingly easy to get great accuracy from here, and you can take down eight crystals with 10 arrows pretty easily. And if you take down eight crystals with just eight arrows, you look like an absolute badass, let's be honest. You do need to be careful you don't get hit by the dragon, and you have to pay attention to how many fireballs are being shot. So I only built up about 10 blocks high in total, and pearl to a north-south waiting position once I'm done shooting crystals. You also may want to build stairs instead of directly straight up, as the dragon's breath particles can be a bit annoying when you're one cycling and your pillar could end up blocking some bed damage. Also, in previous versions, the dragon will get stuck on this build when it's perching, so fair warning. The half bow automat variation comes in at a solid 155 average end fight with an impressive 109 high roll. 
coming pretty close to the north-south waiting fastest times, but with a way better three-minute low roll if you do end up getting unlucky. I consider this strategy medium difficulty, and with some practice, I think it's definitely safe enough to use in an RSG PB pace run, and is my personal go-to end fight strategy. Lastly, we're going to go over the half bow ninja brain variation. Ninja Brain developed this idea a few months ago and just recently posted a video on it, but this is by far the riskiest and most aggressive variation. The basic idea is to pearl as quickly as possible to a hopefully tall enough north-south pillar and begin shooting crystals immediately. The further crystals are pretty challenging to hit, so this does take quite a lot of accuracy and practice, but once you get eight crystals down, you're already in a perfect position to induce a north-south perch. The two risky time saves that you can use are number one, skipping the one cycle prep in the center as you have a great view on the dragon from up here to know exactly when it's perching and purling from above can actually get you to the middle very quickly. And number two, the biggest time save is shooting crystals before actually pillaring all the way up to about Y120. The safest idea is to pillar up above the dragon first and then shoot crystals so it can never run into you. But if you start shooting immediately, you get a considerable time save, but have to be very careful about the dragon running into you. Now, because of how aggressive this strategy is, the half bow ninja brain variation gives the best average end fight time of any strategy. And in terms of high roll is amazingly only three seconds slower than the north south ground weight. Even on an unlucky low roll is still about the same as the reliable full bow strategy. Impressive numbers for sure, but definitely the most difficult strategy listed here, and is only for absolute giga chads. It also has the most requirements as you'll not only need 4 beds, a bow and at least 10 arrows, but a few ender pearls, plenty of blocks, and enough health and hunger to be able to pearl multiple times. And that's it for the strategies I want to cover in this video. The last thing I want to leave you with is to go over which one of these strategies is the best to use based on the situation. I obviously brought all of these up because no single one of these is going to be the best overall. So I'm going to show a couple examples of actual runs where it's helpful to know these numbers. And yes, right before I get into that, I know some of you are wondering, but TWAGs, what about the zero cycle? You love it and it's the best thing ever. Why haven't you mentioned that? Well, the zero cycle, while being the greatest idea known to man, is still in its early stages of development. I have a full 43 minute guide to it on my channel, so I won't get into it here, but the basic idea is to pearl up to the dragon and kill it before it ever reaches its first node. It's incredibly difficult and not possible on that many end islands, but does result in very consistent fast times when it works. So if you're wondering why I didn't include it on this graph, it's because it would look like this. Most of the time you would probably fail the zero cycle, but the times you succeed literally can never be more than about a minute. So I'll skip it for now, but I do hope one day this entire guide becomes completely irrelevant and the zero cycle becomes so reliable it's the only strategy we use. But for now, let's move on to these three examples. For the first, I'd like to give my opinion on what's the best strategy for an RSG PB. Let's take a look back at Brentilda's 9 minute and 30 second world record run for this one. Brentilda enters the end around 8 minutes and 20 seconds, which back in April when this happened was absolutely unheard of. In most cases, your RSG PB run will have to rely on high rolls. If you're playing thousands of seeds over the course of many months, you'll likely enter the end on PB pace multiple times. There's some argument that you might be happy with a safe average length end fight, but the opportunity to get an amazing time via high rolling, in my opinion, is just too great. The fact that we need to rely on a high roll and also the crazy amount of nerves we all feel on PB pace means we need a high roll strategy that's also very easy. The standard north-south waiting strategy is definitely the correct play here. To get a sub 10, Brentilda just needs a 1 minute and 40 second end fight, which waiting north-south would give him about 62% of the time. Even if Brentilda had bow and arrows here, using them under pressure could be slow and on average wouldn't help that much in getting a sub 10. Brentilda ends up getting fairly lucky with a 77th percentile perch, resulting in an incredible world record that still stands today. The next example is from a run featuring Rainex from early May. Rain is playing in a Break the Record Live event, which not only offered cash prizes for the fastest runs completed within the time period, but there were also five dream bounties available for this event, with any sub-15 minute run winning $4,000. 
Now, Rain being the absolute Omega Chad he is, has already secured the top time and two of the Dream Bounties with only one of them remaining. Rain spots a Bridge Bastion at around four minutes into a run. And during the route, Rain loots a Bastion chest, ignoring a crossbow and 14 arrows, which would have been plenty for a half post strategy. But at the time, runners were only using the high roll north-south weight strategy, as that's the best play in RSG, and finishing runs by a specific time in a tournament setting was a fairly new concept. Rain plays the rest of the run incredibly well and enters the end at 12 minutes and 33 seconds, which gives him 2 minutes 27 to beat the game to win $4,000. A well-played north-south waiting strategy, which Rain does, would do this 61% of the time. Some of you may remember this moment, but this run ends in tragedy, as Rainex doesn't pull the 39th percentile luck he needs, his dragon instead gives him 36th percentile luck, and he finishes the run at a 1508. Heartbreaking, but of course Rain still walked away with plenty of turning winnings and first place in the tournament overall. Now, if Rain had gotten the crossbow and arrows, which strategy would have given him the best odds of getting that sub-15? Again, for north-south waiting, a 227 end fight or better would happen 61% of the time. But for either half bow or full bow, those statistics are much better. Rain would have only had 12 arrows, so let's assume he would do a half bow strategy. If we applied the same percentile RNG from Rain's dragon that he did get to the other strategies, the Automat or Ninja Brain Halfbow end fight would have guaranteed Rain the sub-15 and $4,000. Now, who knows what actually would have happened using a different strategy, and this is also assuming near-perfect play and not taking into account nerves. But still, as we're seeing more and more tournaments, it's nice to be practiced in multiple end fight styles and be able to recognize a situation where one gives you better odds than another, especially when the difference between winning and losing is just a few seconds. And for the last example, I wanted to bring up the recent K4 hour challenge, which ends in a few days. K4 is offering a prize to runners who can beat the game as many times as possible in the span of four hours. So what end fight strategy is the best over many runs and a large sample size? Well, the answer is simply whichever has the best average. And as we look at the table again, it surprisingly doesn't matter. The Ninja Brain half bow variation has the best average, but it's also the riskiest, and you don't want to be throwing a good pace run in this challenge, so between waiting, half bow, and full bow, they're all about the same. I could definitely see an argument where over 4 hours you'd want the simplest, least risky end fight, which would just be waiting north south. Sometimes you're going to get a 5 minute perch, but other times you'll get an instant perch, and in the end it'll balance out. I could also see an argument that 5 minute perches are tilting, and to save your mental maybe you just do full bow every time so you're never disappointed. In the end it's all about preference, and again I would just practice all of these until you find one that just feels the best. I'll leave you with a general rule of thumb I found by comparing the data. If you're in a situation where you need to finish the game in under a minute 30, then waiting north-south is statistically going to give you the best odds. If you're in a situation where you just need to finish the game before, say, 2 minutes and 30 seconds, then use your preferred half bow method for best odds. And if you're in a situation where you just need to finish the game any longer than those times, using a full bow and taking out all the crystals will give you the best chance of success. Well, that's everything I wanted to say about end fights. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.